Welcome back, everyone. This is theCUBE's coverage in Las Vegas for reInvent. That's AWS's annual user conference. This is our 11th CUBE year at reInvent. I'm John Furrier, your host. Dave Vellante, my co-host, is downstairs in the sugarcane with MongoDB, another set down there. We're doing the biggest editorial coverage ever of a reInvent. You're seeing everything on SiliconANGLE, theCUBE, live streaming out of Palo Alto for our SuperCloud 5 special edition just for this one uh, generative AI week. I call it the battle for AI supremacy. Adam Stileski delivered a mecha, mecha keynote this morning about how Amazon is going to be not only a leader, but an extender of the value of the mission of AWS. Um, Game-changing event here, I think, for Amazon. I think it was a very offensive, positive keynote. And I've got a guest here to unpack it all with us. Bratton Sato is the VP of AI and Machine Learning Services with AWS Cube Alumni. Was on earlier as a preview. Brett, great to see you. Thank you, thank you for having me. It's always great talking to you. So Adam had a keynote, and you know he could have been defensive, okay? And I've been saying all along, Amazon can't play defense especially when people are saying they weren't in AI before Microsoft and others. And everyone who knows Amazon knows that there's a deep pedigree of database, AI, machine learning. Generative AI is just a new thing, but it's, it's important. It's an important trend. So, that, so I wanna, I'm glad to see him at, lay out the keynote, but he's got great products out there. He's showing some real meat on the bone on content and products. Q, we saw um, the, um, the data, the storage got innovated and reinvented. He laid out the three layer stack. Uh, so much action. I mean, what does it mean? Take us through the, the, the implications from an AI perspective, what, what Adam's keynote delivers. Look, as you said, John, we have a very long heritage and a rich heritage in machine learning. We have been doing it for longer than anyone else. Um, and what Adam laid out today was a very comprehensive picture, the three layer stack that mm -hmm. he talked about. It starts with the infrastructure where you know, we have our GPUs, but we also have our custom processors, Trainium and Inferentia, and you get significant performance benefits and cost performance benefits from those. And then you have SageMaker that provides you the end-to-end -end software infrastructure for building and training. And then, so there are some customers who say, you know what, I want to go in and build my own models or deploy my own models, they can use that. Mm -hmm. Then you have customers who say, no, I just want to use models that are provided by Amazon or others, and there we have Bedrock, and that provides you the most choice mm -hmm. that there is out there of state-of-the-art models, along with other capabilities we talked about today, like agents and RAG knowledge bases and so on. And then you have the set of <laughs> applications at the top. You know, we launched yeah. Amazon Q today. We think it's going to transform the way employees interact with the data. So you know you have Q for business users, you have Q for Connect, which is contact center, you have Q for the AWS. So I think it's it's a really good set and it just keeps mm -hmm. sh just shows that we'll keep on innovating. <laughs> you know, we we had HealthScribe, we had Code Whisperer, now we have Q and we'll just keep innovating. So I want to just get this out of the way because I want to make sure this context to the next couple questions. Your title is VP of AI and Machine Learning Services. What specifically are you overseeing in your function? So there are the three, we talked about the three layers of the stack, so mm -hmm. you know, across the three layers, so there's the SageMaker mm -hmm. and the infrastructure portions, then there is uh, Q, mm -hmm. then there is our investments in health AI, in contact centers, uh, personalization, uh, the low code thing that we have in SageMaker Canvas, then our industrial AI, which is Monitron, then we have the AI in the edge and cameras, which is Panorama. And you're overseeing all that product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Q's under you. Amazon Q, so Amazon Q for business, that was also launched today. Yep. That was, uh, you know, the one that customers can ask questions. Yeah, that's, the, that, the developers one, we've seen versions of SageMaker out there, but there's no IDE support yet on that one. So, so Q had two components to it, developer piece, Yes. And then the user piece. Yes. So the user piece was the new piece. Yes, yes, that okay. was the one, yeah. yes. So that's one Matt Wood gave the demo yes, on. Yes, yes, that's the one that's also. Okay, got here. it. Okay, so, so he mentioned vector embeddings is what makes all the reasoning happen. Um, we're going to hear that tomorrow on the keynote? Well, <laughs> what, what, what? No, you don't need to answer that. I think the answer is so, yes. So, um, in Amazon Q, uh, when a user comes in and asks a query, then you know it uses it uses it has to have access to the company's information to be able to get that answer. And there we use a number of techniques to get it 
quickly and efficiently and accurately. You know, one of the things that's coming out of the three layer stack is this obviously the middle layer, which is the LLM foundation model layer. Yeah. I call it middle layer, middleware, because you know, I like to think simply, you know, infrastructure, middleware, app, just kind of as a simple oversimplification, but mental model. A lot of actions going on there, so I wanted to get your thoughts. I've been thinking a lot about, since our last interview, the role of data and how data helps AI, but how generative AI helps data. Because there's going to be this symbiotic relationship and flywheel between data yeah. and generative AI. Yeah. What's the vision of that? Because again, you're hitting all three layers of the stack. That means data's got to work up and down and across. Yes. So, you know, we think having a robust data service is essential for customers, yeah. and this predates <laughs> Gen AI. Any machine learning system we have built requires data as a critical ingredient. So there I think at AWS, we really have the most comprehensive set of services, you know, storing, querying, analyzing your data. Then data labeling services, where we have, you know, SageMaker ground truth. So I think all of this is critical if you have to build generative AI or any kind of AI. The other way, you are also seeing Gen AI, you can use Gen AI for data, synthetic data generation. So there are many situations where it's hard to get a lot of data and then you can use synthetic data generation there as well. So I, I do think there's going to be that flywheel. Mm -hmm. And also as customers you know, use our services more, we are going to keep refining things. So I think that, and that, you know, the fact that we have more customers than anyone else actually helps us have that flywheel. Let me ask you a question, since you brought up synthetic data, because that's been a big conversation in the industry. Um, some people don't, may or may not understand specifically what that is and where it's helpful and where it's developing. So what is the role of synthetic data? Now, see, I see the edge is a key area because the edge yeah. needs more data and why move data around if you can get synthetic. But, but the, the goal of synthetic data is what? What's the purpose and where is it developed and where is it developing in terms of use cases? You know, there are many situations. So if you're training, if you're doing machine learning, you need a lot of training data. There are many situations where you can get it, but there are many other situations where it's hard to get it. I'll give you one example. Let's say you want to do for defect detection. Now in defect detection, you don't have a lot of defects. It's <laughs> hard to get real data. <laughs> yeah. But there you can use simulated data where yeah. you're simulating various kinds of defects to train a machine learning model. So those kinds of situations mm -hmm. where it's hard to get data, yeah. you can use synthetic data. In that case, no one wants to build defects just for the sake of doing defects. <laughs> exactly. So you get more visibility into multiple scenarios. Yeah. Is that going to be, is that going to enter us into a new era of digital twins? Because if, you, if that goes forward, you, we're going to have a lot of simulation. Is that? Simulations are going to be important as well. You can imagine a situation where you know, you're simulating a lot of these, uh, a lot of simulations are happening for various activities. It can actually be, one part yeah. of that can also be data generation, but one part of that is yeah. just simulating a physical process. You know, you got to be pretty excited about Q. I, I can imagine that was pretty, um, yes. Monumental, probably been working on it for a while. It's Especially a very innovative product. <laughs> it's really game changing. You know, just build the cube app for me. I can't wait to get our business transforming and reinventing. But uh, uh, one thing that jumped out at me, I want to get your thoughts on this, because this is the theme I saw in the keynote and I see as this the new next gen AWS. The game has changed, is cost and performance is whether it's GPU stacking on a rack, whether you got um, the connectors around them, or it's going to make it faster, but also more energy efficient with the chips. And then on the, on the Q side, the demo of migrating to a thousand Java apps in two days, I mean, I kind of fell out of my chair at that moment because you go, okay, that's a Herculean task to do that that fast. And then the teaser of .NET to Linux will wipe out licenses costs for the customer. So we're in a new era where you're seeing step function cost savings and massive productivity gains at the same time. Can you scope the order of magnitude for us, like where this is going? Because I mean, just there, I'm just already seeing, if that's pretty massive, that's a no-brainer, I mean. You know, I think generative AI will help us in every task we do, in the, you know, in the long run. Maybe even in the long run, in the medium <laughs> run, it's going to come in and get integrated into everything we do. Software is going to be a big one. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the migration, the translation that you yeah. talked about. There's also code generation with Code <laughs> Whisperer, right? Uh, and we have done studies where we have seen developers get up to 50% more productive. Yeah. So all of these, I mean, I can imagine test generation going yeah. there. So all of these are going to see very step function changes. Yeah. Yeah. And the three things you mentioned are going to be key. You know, cost, accuracy, performance, latency. You know, all of these are going to be yeah. key. 
Yeah, and I like how the MV Link we bringing that together. Yep. Um, while I got you here, one of the things that Adam mentioned was he sees a lot of success up and down the customer base. Small, medium-sized, busy highlight of the guitar players with the passport thing, I thought was pretty cool, as well as the big leaders like Salesforce. Be a consultant for us now, since we have you here. <laughs> the Cube, we're changing, we have data. What's your advice to us? To how do we change and transform? Do we hire more engineers? How would we take advantage, if you are giving us free consulting in real time, <laughs> what would, what, what, how do we take the next step? Because we see advantages. I think if you are looking, so um, we, we look at the customer persona and what you want to mm -hmm. get done. If you're trying to build scalable applications using foundation models, then Bedrock is the easiest way to get started. Um, and so I would, I would use one of those models um, and then you know it's pretty you know you pipe it to your or hook it up with your data yeah. sources and you know off you go. Now if you want to get to a higher level abstraction, like I can imagine in your company, you want people to be using Q. You want your employees to be using Q. In those cases, you probably don't want to necessarily yeah. build it yourself, yeah. you just want to go over there. So what I would say is it's really important to get started and it's really important to test these things out and then you yeah. know integrate them into your workflows because they are going to change the way things yeah. are done. That's great, that's great feedback. I want to just get your thoughts on Matt Wood's demo, three steps, three was just go, it was really two steps. In every major inflection point that I've lived through in my career, PC and web, um, Every time it was also embryonic, massive ob ob adoption of the concept. Some naysayers, oh, it's never going to be, the, the web's a toy, it's, for, it's not real, it's too slow. Everything was poo-pooed about the World Wide Web, the internet. And then it grows fast. Here, in all those areas, they got faster, but the successful players made it simpler and reduced the steps it takes to do stuff. Yeah. And it's and simpler and intuitive. Yeah. Is this where you guys see this going? Because I, I saw simplicity with the Q demo, where click, click, you're in, three is your action, actioning value. Ease of use is very important to us. You know, it is pretty fundamental to a design process. And you know, we do UX designs pretty early, we look at the mock-ups, is this easy enough for the customer? Are we adding friction to it? Because if we don't do it, you know, customers get frustrated. So making things not just, you know, performant and low cost and latency, that is certainly important, but making things easy is important as well. And there's multiple ways of making things easy. That's the aspect you mentioned, which yeah. is, you know, we make it easy to set up. There's of course the easy to use as well, but there's also kind of a no code aspect of it, you know, where we have no code products like SageMaker, mm -hmm. Canvas, and so on, to make things easy for customers. So you, you, you know, you said it right. Ease of use is okay. really important to us. I love the race to the top comment by the Anthropic founder. I like that, that philosophy. But also, after that was over, you, you guys went into the Titan model. So you got Anthropic, which is a relationship which we reported and validated at the keynote. It's got some chip optimization, which is going to be advantages to your customers. And then the Titan model came out. They talked about, <laughs> I love hearing this at the keynote, fine tuning, RAG, <laughs> which is retrieval, augmentation, and generation, and continued pre training. I mean, that's pretty techy. So, how is Titan going? And the Anthropic is not an Amazon company. It's just one model of many. Titan's the Amazon model. What can we expect from Amazon to innovate on going forward on Titan? And how does that fit into the selection? Is that more just your proprietary model or your model? Does it work with certain databases? What's the, how should we think about Titan? We will continue to keep innovating in this space and continue to provide choice to our customers, right? And so I think you should continue, you will continue to see more of these models being developed by us. At the same time, we'll continue to partner very closely with Anthropic, like you know, their models will be available earlier on Bedrock, as was said today, uh, and with the other providers we have, you know, AI21, Stability, um, Cohere, and the others. So I think giving choice, and you know, and then on SageMaker Jumpstart, mm -hmm. you have the richest collection of other models. So I think we are going to continue to innovate, innovate on Titan, while at the same time taking a lot of state-of-the-art models to give it to customers on Bedrock, and just making sure customers get what they need. So and that, that I think is really important. Like you want to have a choice, and as we build these systems ourselves, and you know, yeah. you've seen this also, 
it's really important to have a variety of models that you can choose from. Yeah, the choice was a great home run in the keynote. That's that's a winning hand. You never want to, you never bet against choice, in my opinion. Yeah. Open and choice always wins. Yeah. I think that's going to be a long game play. We'll, I'm sure that's going to pay out. We'll, we'll look like a, you know predictors. That's easy to predict. Nitro was a big part of things. Um, the EV, the, I mean the MV link with uh, NVIDIA. Now at the infrastructure layer, what's going on there for AI and ML? Because if you look at what, and I wasn't expecting Jensen to be on stage because I didn't. You guys weren't included in the DGX launch that they had, but that brings to the table not just GPUs. So you're a customer on one hand, uh, and they have their thing, but pulling it together around the chips. And we, we talked about this on the cube when you last on about end to end. And now I see where you were going with that. Mm -hmm. There's more there than just buying GPUs. Oh yeah, you know, when you're setting up these clusters for generative AI, you're talking of tens of thousands of nodes, tens of thousands of instances. These have to communicate with each other. Like you have to take the weights and parameters and data and send it out and then yeah. overlap the communication with the computation. There's a lot of, you know, it's just not chips. There is that, then there is the interconnect, then there's the bandwidth of the interconnect. You know, we have EFA networking over there. Then we have our own custom chips. We of course have GPUs. Now we have you know the NVLink, the G yeah. DGX Club. I think it's. A, I think you know. We are providing the most performant infrastructure from a hardware perspective to our customers. Rathan, I got to ask you this because I just saw Swami again. I know his database background. He's famous for the DynamoDB, and then came from an intern. Now his big dog up in the Amazon. Um, the data business is changing the role of where the DNA in the industries come from. You know, when I went to college, I got my database, one of my tracks was database. It was databases, and that's what you did. You'd, schemas, unstructured kind of wasn't around, the object store didn't exist. Um, now it's not about databases. I mean, you got to know databases, but the data industry, the data core competency, the data skill, is more like a operating system kind of thought, probably, or a systems uh, architecture. Um, What's your view on this? Because a lot of people are transitioning into this platform engineering meets data, moving into the developer world where just like infrastructure as code, you need data as code, you got developers shifting left with data. We hear guardrails, you announced a guardrail product here today. So developers will be shifting data into their pipelines. What is the future of the data career? It's not just databases anymore, it's more like architecting platforms. I think so. Customers ultimately want actionable insights from the data. So having a robust data platform is always going to be important. And having clean data and data pre-processing, data post-processing, data quality as part of it will be important. Now what will happen is as people are going about their work, they want actionable insights as they're doing the work. And so you're going to see a lot of this the infrastructure, the machinery for providing actionable insights kind of get yeah. pulled into the work. And that is where you know the data and the AI and the generative AI yeah. thing is going to be That's going. a great observation. In essence, latency now is redefined not just on packet latency, latency to create a value. The more you're yeah. engaging and iterating or inferring, using inference and other things. How quickly am I able to surface a good actionable insight that <laughs> makes a difference to what you're doing? Well, this is a low latency conversation we're having here and a high <laughs> bandwidth one yeah. as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming on theCUBE, really appreciate uh, your insights. It's always great to have you on. It's like a master class in AI, and thank you for your perspective and, and taking time out of your busy schedule. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure <laughs> talking to you. You're always riffing on theCUBE, we're bringing, but this is important stuff. The game has changed, and data and AI are going to work together, and the synthesis of data, and how data in, helps Gen AI, and how Gen AI helps data. This is going to be a new flywheel, and it's going to be a whole other game changing, and theCUBE's got it for you. We've got a ton of data coming up at theCUBE. We've got articles on SiliconANGLE, theCUBE.net, tons of videos. This is our biggest reinvent ever in our 11 year history. Thanks for watching. Back to the studio for our special SuperCloud 5 event. We'll be back with more after this short break.